Thank you, uh, Chairman Powell, for uh, stepping up again and being willing to take the job on. Congratulations. I'm going to go back to a, a question somebody asked probably an hour and a half ago. A very high level uh, point that the person, that one of my colleagues made, and I don't remember which one, but he said in congratulating you that President Biden clearly has confidence in your ability to lead our economy through this crisis. And um, without judging those particular words, I'd ask you flat out, do you lead our economy? Is that what your job is to do, is to lead the economy? I, I, I'm uh, responsible for an agency that has that has specific narrow mandates. I wouldn't want to characterize it uh, one way or the other. I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't either, quite honestly. But um, <laughs> I have great, great respect for and confidence in our free market economy with a very light regulatory touch. Um, that said, I also want to associate myself with Senator Kennedy's strong word of encouragement to keep the Fed independent. That is why I respect you so much. Uh, Chairman Paul, is in, uh, under the previous president, you, you maintained independence, and we would certainly hope and expect that you'd continue that independence under the current uh, administration. I want to, you've, you've touched on this, uh, but I want just a little further clarification, because somebody, I think it was Senator Menendez, asked you, uh, how, how do you balance the two mandates? <clears throat> of course, price stability and a maximum uh, employment. I thought you did a pretty good job, but I want to give you a chance to make it even clearer. And maybe I'll help with the way I form the question. Doesn't price stability naturally lead to a strong economy, which naturally leads to to a maximum employment? In, in other words, you talked, I think, in your answer that you know we focus on whichever ones in the needs the help the most at a given time. That's my paraphrase of it. But perhaps you could just elaborate a little bit on. Sure. That. So most of the time, most of the time, monetary policy works the same way for both of them. You know, usually inflation is low when, you know, when the economy is weak, when, when unemployment is high. And so you, you cut interest rates and that, that, that helps unemployment go down and helps inflation move up, back up to 2%. So usually that's the case, almost all the time. In rare occasions, though, you have a situation where, where, the, where the two sort of goals are not complementary. And we, we have, we've had a little bit of that here. I'm not sure we have it anymore, but the idea being that we were far from maximum employment. That, that's no longer the case, but inflation was really high. So um, uh, it, I think the situation today is more correctly characterized as we're very rapidly approaching or at maximum employment, and we're far away from our inflation tool. There's no basis to prefer one of the two goals over the other, but our, our form, you know, our, our constitutionally adopted document at the Fed, our statement on longer run goals and monetary policy strategy says when this is the case, we, we look how far something is from the goal and how long it'll take to get to the goal. And we look at the other goal and, and we use our tools. And I think in the current, the current application of that provision would say you, you need to focus on getting inflation under control because you're not going to have maximum employment unless you have price stability. I agree. Thank you. Well said. Um, in fact, with that in mind, I, what I worry the most about with the Fed, um, and you and I have discussed this previously, is the mission creep that I think <clears throat> both clouds and frankly complicates that main mission of price stability. If you're having to sit around and you have to hire people that are going to assess climate risk as an example, as though banks themselves aren't already considering that, which by the way, climate risk in my mind is really regulatory risk um, because climate is a global issue. It's not a domestic issue. Uh, it's a domestic issue to the degree it's a, a global issue. But what I worry about is the natural outcome of further regulations in the climate sphere and that's what we're talking about with the climate stress test um, or cyber stress test or any, any other number of, of tests, but climate in particular. The natural outcome is that we're going to tr somehow transfer our climate guilt to other countries who don't have our environmental and labor standards. In other words, we don't do anything to help the climate except, um, except to have more imports from, uh, from faraway places that are much larger polluters than ours. So I, I have to tell you, I'm a little worried. I'm quite worried, actually, mostly worried about the mission creep at the Fed should we continue to add these extra things that you have to be focused on. And I would just ask for uh, a response to that, and then my time will wrap up. Well, I, I, I agree with your principle, that, which is that we got to stick to our knitting if, we want, knitting if we want to remain independent. I really do. And, uh, you know, I guess I would say climate is appropriate for us as an issue to the extent it fits within our existing mandates. And, and I think it does 
uh, you know, in the sense of it's another risk over time that banks are going to run. And but we're we're not, you know, we're not. The broader answer to climate change has to come from legislators, and um, and the private sector. I, I agree. Thank you, and I look forward to supporting your confirmation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.